before I start the presentation, I'd just like to say thank you. I think there's some wonderful ideas. Um, I should have been writing it down, but I'm trying to remember some of the things. And I think, in fact, I know there are many people in this room that have already started doing some of the things that you've talked about in, in small ways. Certainly, uh, Karina Adolson over in Rackford, she started the mums football. And, and so some people have these ideas and, and they're starting to work. And it's good to see from your angle that uh, somebody else is doing it and it's not just some crazy idea from somebody here. These things work. And if anything, from the first two conferences we had, uh, I can see everyone said, yeah, this was a good idea, that was a good idea. But then when they got outside, but it won't work here in Estonia. Without really giving a good reason why it won't work. The only reason things won't work is if you don't want them to work or you don't try them. And I think there's plenty of things there that you can look at, experiment with, and try. I think it was a, a fantastic presentation with some wonderful ideas, so, so thank you. Uh, other things as well on the coaching side. She used a taboo word here. What was a taboo word here? I think it's changing slightly. And certainly, again, to give credit to, to many people in this room, the word volunteer. It's not a big thing. Uh, it wasn't a big thing in Estonia. I think it's changing, and, and I'm happy that it's changing because it, it can't always be about how many euros am I going to get for doing this job. And I think there's people in this room that, that are doing it voluntarily, and, and it's, a, it's a massive step forward. Also, when we start talking about female coaches, female leaders, uh, the guys in the room sometimes get intimidated by that. Start to think maybe you don't need us, maybe you don't want us. And, and I've been guilty of that at FIFA and UEFA seminars before now, uh, where you think, well, the, I, I've been doing this for 35 years and all of a sudden nobody wants me uh, to be involved in girls and women's football. And I think some of the other guys might start, well, hang on, I, you know, I'm, I'm good at this, I enjoy this, I'm passionate about this. And I think it's clear to the, to the guys in here to understand that it's not about that, you know, the girls and the women need you to help them, but you need them to help you. And I think that's the biggest step forward we're making here. Um, I'm looking around me now, three years ago, there are many females in here that three years ago were only players, uh, but almost all of them in here now are now qualified coaches. So in the last three years, they're all coaches. So again, our steps forward have been, have been really great. My presentation is a little bit more geared towards where, where we've been, where we're going with the national teams uh, and the things we look at on the player development pathway for, for our level, the level that we, we require. I'm going to touch back on the grassroots stuff because without the grassroots, nothing can happen. So uh, hopefully we'll, uh, we'll understand as we go along. So this is our title, it's a Development Pathway and the Profile uh, of a National Team Player. We held some coaches meetings last year that I felt were very successful. Um, I got some really good feedback from coaches. And, and as I go through the presentation, I'm gonna talk about some meetings that I've had recently uh, with some of the issues and some of the problems. Um, but I'll, I'll bring that up as we go along. So. Just a little reminder of where we've come from. Um, the 1890s is when women's football started, the 1890s. So these pictures, uh, just to remind you, it's been around longer than maybe some of us think. So these are from the early 1900s, around 1920, First World War. Uh, and Lily Parr is one of the most recognized players, certainly in England. And not many people scored over a thousand goals in their career. Pele was one. Um, so he's matched with a female footballer. And the, the woman in the corner there, Bella Ray, 133 goals scored in one season. I'd love to have her playing for us right now. That would be a real help. Okay, so just looking at the, the pathway, um, it steps. It's about steps. You can do it in a pyramid format, but I've chosen to do it in a, in a step. So our grassroots is obviously what we've just been discussing. And the younger we can start them, the better. The schools projects now are, are phenomenal. The work that Tate and, and the grassroots department have done is, 
is absolutely amazing, and I know we have uh, Enerly and uh, Lex now involved in, in those areas. It, it's been a fantastic step for us. From there, our first process at the moment is our under-15 development process. Now, we're talking about the way we're looking at it from the national team angle. We're hoping next year, as it says at the top, to maybe start looking at one year younger, but we start at under-15 development. If you're not aware yet, as from last year, we now have under-15s participating in the Baltic Cup, and we have some friendly games arranged with the club from Finland. And this year, uh, the under-15s, I'll do some advertising for you, Indrek, will be playing in a tournament in Polva. And Indrek has already attained uh, Sunderland Ladies Football Club's Centre of Excellence team to come over and participate in that tournament. Uh, so there'll be an, an elite group with uh, our national team, a uh, Finnish club, Sunderland, and the team from Polva. Again, this is the sort of thing we need, uh, need more of. So again, it will be a great experience for our under-15s. Under-16 development, this is the first time uh, in Estonia where we've had the luxury of having so many players that we split our under-17s into two groups. So our under-17, we have our, what we feel are our players that are ready for that level, and then we have a, a younger group and some of the under-17 older players that aren't quite there yet, but we're training them as well in two separate groups. So we're having gatherings and we're training both groups and so obviously the late developers will come through a little bit later on, hopefully, providing we can keep them involved in the game. From there, we have the under-17 national team. Um, the tournament that starts tomorrow is under-18, so it's some of the younger under-19s with the under-17s and some of the new group. Um, unfortunately, we've, we've had a sad injury to, to the main goalkeeper for this team, uh, but two young keepers are stepping in for this tournament. Uh, and it's, it's all about development. It is a development tournament. So tomorrow they play Portugal, which is quite a daunting opponent. And then they have Lithuania and Ukraine. What do we expect from that group? We expect good performances. Do we expect to win every game? Of course we don't expect it. Will we try to? Yes, we will try. But it is a development tournament. Please, when you're watching uh, and supporting the players, which I hope many of you do, please understand it is a development tournament. And while I'm on that, I'll quickly touch on the subject of the youth team being in the expert league. Because again, there were many doubters wondering whether this should happen, whether it shouldn't. One good comment was that it should be more than a one-year project this time, and I, I agree with that. Again, understand that is to give them experience. The gap between our under-17s playing in B-class only, for instance, and playing in a tournament like this or in the European tournaments is as wide as the Grand Canyon, if not wider. So we need to try and give them a tougher development process. So I want to thank the expert league teams uh, and coaches for agreeing with it, even if you had some doubts, but please, when you play that team, remember that we're just trying to develop them. And uh, yeah, I'm not saying don't go out and beat them because you may need the points. But please consider, uh, you know, who you're playing against and, and remember that, that we're trying to develop your players of the future. And the experience they get now playing in that team could mean they're going to be a great player for you in the future. So make sure you look at it the correct way, please. Well, see then, the jumps get bigger. So the jump from the under-16 development to the under-17 isn't so big. Then you have the jump from the under-17 uh, to the under-19 gets a little bit bigger. And this is an age group in particular where we can lose players. They start to change their mind about whether they want to be a football player, whether they don't, and the seriousness of how they want to take it. And a lot of that comes from the experience they're not only getting with us, but the experiences they're getting at the club. So that's why what you do is, again, still so important. Then, obviously, the bigger jump, the jump from the U19 to the senior A national team. That's the one where they can fall down in between and we lose them forever. So one cure is that we're trying to look at a development squad under 21, under 23, where we have a bridge uh, and where, again, maybe even then there can still be some late developers or some that have dipped and, and want to come back into it. That's something that 
that we're still discussing and we're trying to organise. Uh, again, it's controlled by budget and time scales uh, and how much time we have ourselves as coaches to, to do that, but it's the way we want to go. But these are the stepping stones and uh, that's what they are now. They could change again in the future. But again, the process has a lot to do with you uh, as clubs and coaches. Quick brush on me on the grassroots. So it's where it all begins. I'll say this slowly so the interpreters can understand me okay. The most important years for a young player without any, any doubt. So this is where the first image is. And again, it's so much in line with what you were talking about, um, are formed. Also the first memories and the first experiences. First impressions are important. They tend to stick. They stay in their minds. So hence the vital importance of good role models, coaches, players. So coaches and senior players at club as well as national team level. Doesn't have to be a national team player to be a good role model for your club teammates or the younger players in your club. Both good and bad habits can be formed and bad ones are much harder to change than keeping the good ones. Cliche, practice does not necessarily make perfect, but it can for sure make permanent. So good practice as opposed to poor practice is a key element in what we're doing. Why do we keep talking about the fun dementals? Again, in your presentation, you talked about the fun games, the imagination games for the younger ones. Um, I'm not gonna sell my books again, but some of you know that I've written books on the fun games for the younger ones. Uh, and again, a vital component. And I've always said on the C license courses that myself and Catherine have delivered, with the little ones, use your imagination, take games from the TV, take things from magazines, comic books, something that the young ones can relate to and attach it to football and, and you get a better response. So, i.e. the Batman and the Superman and we have Ghostbusters and things like this, it's, it all fits. So please try and understand, we're not suggesting you should not want to, to or try to win. In fact, it's a respect for the game that you should play to win. What is wrong is that the child feels sad and fears being shouted at or punished if they don't win. Playing and enjoying the game should come first. Win or lose, they can still have fun. Fact is, at some point, they will lose and if they've had a fear of losing, the impact can be twice as bad. This is when we can lose them from the game. Too much pressure, too early. So for me, the first question when they go home, if their parents aren't there watching, which here, if we're honest, not many parents come to support their, their children. But the first question when they go home should be, did you have fun? How did you play? Not, did you win? Uh, I'm not sure that happens, uh, but I hope it's something that we can look at. This fear factor of losing players from the game, I'm, I'm going to bring something up here, and I hope I'm going to eyeball two guys here. Uh, I don't want to upset anybody, but I watched the game the other night. If you have my Facebook page, I'm looking quite cold, sitting in the stand, uh, watching a game that finished with a big scoreline. And... This is with total respect to the guys. They let me speak to them afterwards, the coaches, and I asked questions. How, how did you feel about that game? How did you feel about the scoreline? If I'd have been in your position, what might I have done? So it was a B-class game. I have to look at it from two angles. Massive scoreline, 20-0. So I look at it from two angles. Did Every player in the winning team need to play every minute of, of the game. Did the weaker players perhaps would have benefited from, from playing more than the better players at a certain point of the game? And nobody disagreed with me. This is, again, totally respect for them. They didn't disagree. 
the development process could have said, could we rotate the players in their positions? So they could try different positions. And one of the arguments was, well, if we tell the girls that, they don't want to do it. Okay, but you're the coach. The team that lost, uh, the coaches of that team, I know gave them the right information, gave them the right encouragement. However, they lost 20-0. If that happens every week, then maybe some of those players will say, I don't really like this game. I don't really want to play in this game. So again, at that age group, in that level, maybe it's a, a little thing where the coaches can communicate and, you know, I might even have taken one of my players off at a certain point in the game and played a player down. But I certainly would have rotated players and I certainly would have thought about what I was doing. And I'm not, again, criticising anybody. This is just advice and ideas. At the youth level, about developing, but also keeping players in the game. So we don't want a team losing 20-0 every week because I can guarantee some of those players will eventually leave the game. And we need to keep every girl playing. At what point does fun stop becoming important as opposed to winning? The answer is never. Every player, no matter how young or old, needs to carry on having fun and enjoying the game. What changes as they get older is the demands of the game, the, the demand they put on themselves and from you, the coach, depending on the level of the competition. So obviously, national team level, the demands are the highest. Maestro Liga, the demands are high because the golden, if you like, chalice is there, the, the, the trophy at the end. As they become adults, they're more able to cope with the challenges and they self-analyse and they can deal with adversity better, the bad things. And of course, they're more able to challenge you, the coach, in discussions. They're more likely to come and ask you questions. How those areas develop relies heavily on the grounding given during the development years. Have they learned respect through good coaching, your knowledge, your planning, your preparing? and your care and the trust and honesty that you give them, rather than through fear, being scared of you, being scared to make mistakes. Profile of an elite player. So this is what I'm looking for, and the national team staff are looking for as an elite performer. And this would apply to any country, maybe with one or two differences and additions. I make no apologies for using Casey and Marta as the two role models. Casey, as most of you know, has probably driven you crazy over. I coached from when she was eight years of age. And in 2005, she was going to quit the game because she couldn't get into the national team starting lineup. And the, the, the lady that's arriving here later, Hope Powell, was responsible for that. Um, but Hope was still the coach when Casey became England captain and Hope was the coach when Casey became her captain for the Olympic Games. So I was kind of glad I persuaded her to stay in the game because she achieved everything she wanted to achieve. Her dreams were fulfilled. And she even convinced the coach that she was the right person after at one point thinking, I'm not going to get in the team. And I know there's probably one or two players in here thinking, oh, national team, am I going to start? Am I, am I going to be in the squad? Well, it's up to you to prove that point, isn't it? But I'll go quickly round it. I know you're reading that, but for those that maybe don't, I'll go around it. So positive mindset, game understanding, determination, Leadership qualities, both of those players have captained their countries and their clubs. Dedication and resilience. The fitness stuff, the ABCs, agility, balance, coordination, keeping themselves physically fit and prepared. Pride and loyalty, again, a fitness one, speed and power. Self-discipline. So do I go to the nightclub? Do I go to the pizza parlour? Do I go to McDonald's. No one's saying you can't do those things. 
but it's about balance and when you do it. And this is advice you give to players that you think you can help to become an elite performer. It might not be you anymore. Maybe you can afford to go to McDonald's and Pizza Hut and, and do all those luxurious things now because you're not going to be the elite performer. But that doesn't stop you being an elite coach and the developer of an elite performer. Technique, adaptability, versatility. So Casey, one example, broke into the England national team at left fullback. She was a totally right-footed player. And up until then, had only ever played as a centre-back or a right defender. She knew there was a, a sneaky chance of getting into the England squad as a left defender. So she went to work early every morning when she worked with me at the David Beckham Academy, two hours before, and she went outside on the field and practised with her left foot and kept practising until she was probably better with her left foot than she was on her right. And then she got into the England squad as a left defender. In later years, she went back to the central defender position. But now she could play with both feet. So that inspired her to go and work on a weakness. Consistency, passion, role model. Without doubt, those are two of, for me, two of the most significant role models in the women's game. How can you help? And again, I think every conference I've done and spoken about, people go out and, you, or if I write somebody an email, you think you're being attacked. Oh, I need to repeat again, it's never an attack. It's just me asking for your help uh, and cooperation. So good coaching. And I know there's good coaches in this room. Communication. Again, this year for me and the end of last year has been the best for me on the communication between me and you. Obviously, the female coaches, because I've worked with a lot of them anyway, that's easy. Uh, but the club coaches, there's always been maybe some kind of, I don't know, I won't say it's a fear, but it's a hesitation. Um, but I think that's softened, uh, and I really appreciate some of the meetings I've had with the club coaches in the last 12 to 18 months. Maintain high standards. I know that's difficult for you uh, and sometimes, and again, I'll talk about that in a moment. Not for you personally, I mean because of the environment and because of facilitation. Positive feedback, giving positive feedback to your players, not criticism, always giving them positives, learning how to balance that out. If it is criticism, that is constructive criticism and they understand why you're saying it. Good practice, develop yourself. Uh, we've been lucky enough in the last couple of years to have the FIFA courses. Uh, again, I appreciate everybody that turned up at the, the one day course that I did last year as well uh, to introduce the UEFA B information. Uh, and it was higher than that. We actually did some stuff that was more advanced than that. Encourage talent, work to the needs of the players. I think that's a really important one because I think everybody in here has got such a mixture of talent. You've got some potentially elite or already on the way to being elite players, and you've got some that are maybe nowhere close to them. So to train them together in the same group causes you problems in itself because your better players get frustrated with the weaker players, the weaker players get intimidated by the better players, and finding out how to balance that could be really tough, especially if you're working on your own. This is where you need the help and it's where you maybe need the volunteer or you use the better players to help the weaker players there there are ways around it that, that we can certainly help with and discuss the two ones on the outside are kind of left till last do not ignore injuries and don't overplay your players because then you get what are called overuse injuries and i think you know we've had some problems with that in the past she's my best player she has to play. She's come back from an injury, but I'm going to put her in maybe too early because she's important to our team. We need to win the game. She's injured on the field. You pour some cold water on the leg and say, get up. That's not really an assessment. And she's still limping, but you just tell her to carry on. And I'm not, again, attacking any individuals. These are things I've actually seen over the years here when I've watched games. And one player in here in particular came back from injuries probably too early a couple of times. 
and it, it caused problems in the future and it will cause problems in the future. So managing the injuries and understanding them is really important. And if you don't, then you can come to us for advice and help. Our medical department will always help you there and advise you. And a player shouldn't go back playing on the field until they've been cleared by somebody who knows what they're talking about. It's no good just to say a player to you, I feel okay. A player can't just say to you, I feel all right, I can play. They should get clearance from somebody who's qualified to say that, even if it's just a doctor or a general uh, physiotherapist. I added that cloud in the bottom later on on the presentation because I saw it uh, and I think it is. And this goes back to maybe the volunteer process sometimes. Don't coach to live, live to coach. That's certainly what I do. Uh, and it's certainly, I actually am very proud to say and, and chuffed to say there's a lot of people sitting in here looking at me right now that actually love it. They love it. And they do live to coach. Please maintain that. Little snippet, our players overseas. Again, chasing their dreams. That's what I put on there. Different reasons, different ways. Am I that bad? I know, I know. Okay. Okay, so uh, in case you can't see them from where you are, get a la. Obviously, went over to France at uh, Gingon. And you can have the slideshow, Lex. You don't need to take pictures. I'll send you the slideshow. Uh, she's now at Metz. Um, at Gingham, she struggled. She wasn't getting a game every week. And again, you know, they had some heavy defeats. And who's the easiest one to blame? The goalkeeper, right? So it wasn't always her fault. But now she's at a club where she's getting playing time. Uh, then you have uh, Daniela, who's just gone into the second league in Finland. Um, reason for going again wasn't because it was so bad here. Uh, some of her ex-teammates when she was a young, uh, in the young Finnish development squads uh, and friends of hers are playing in that team. And, and also I think her boyfriend lives in Finland, which had something to do with it, um, but she's over there playing now. Hannah Lisa's has just been signed by Oxford United. She's actually studying in Oxford. She didn't go over there for that specific reason, but obviously when I knew where she was, I contacted the coach at Oxford. They're in the English Women's Super League second tier. Um, she's been on the bench, I think, the last couple of games, and they've lost both games. So hopefully the coach will say we need a good defender and get her in there, where she should be. Uh, if not, I might be writing him an email. Um, we all know about how successful Pill has been uh, over in Allen. I think that's one of my favourite pictures of her. It's one of the rare ones, which she actually smiles. Okay? Um, uh, they're, they're still up there in the top two. Her coach now, Gary Williams, is now the assistant coach for the Finnish national team as well. Um, so she's getting a really good coaching environment and, and it's a good club. Uh, Ina obviously followed her love to Hungary as well. Um, but she's playing in Hungary and this is it's quite a good side that she's playing in. Uh, Lise, uh, in case you're not aware, she's given up the national team, which is obviously sad for us. But she's had so many injuries um, and with concussions and the knee injuries and the arm injury. But I think she's going to get herself a career over in the US. She's coaching in the US right now. I did some references for her recently. And she may play again uh, at a slightly lower level uh, to keep herself going. But she graduates fairly soon, I think in May. Uh, from Maine University. So again, successful move for her. Not the dream I hoped, because I wanted her to come back here. But hopefully in the future, she will. Uh, at least as a coach, if not as a player. Tina, she had a fabulous first year at South Alabama. They won their championship. Uh, and I know she's extremely happy. Um, Signy, well, Signy, Signy. Top goal scorer last year. Started off again uh, already this year. They, they only lost on penalties to, to the top, one of the top Finnish teams in the Cup last weekend. But again, Signy, for me, epitomises football. Without any shadow of that, you know, football is in Signy. I've just put that on our Facebook page and some of the girls will know that. Are you in football or is football in you? Signy, I have no doubt. 
football is in Sydney. And uh, I think she'll go on to be even more successful. And Catherine is the one that's just signed for Mirilapi. So she's on a new path. Um, she had an up and down time last year with the club. And she, she was back here training, but she got a really good opportunity to go to this club. And I know she's really excited and she's happy again with the club environment. And I think she'll be involved in maybe coaching some of the princesses as well. Geta has also done another coaching qualification in France and she's coaching young players in France as well. So again, this all adds to what, what we've achieved. If like. These are success stories for us. It's tough for me in one way because when good players leave this country, it weakens our competition. So that's the sad part for me in a way because if those players were playing for clubs in this country still, then maybe the league would be a little bit closer and a little bit more balanced. But this is something, the stage we're at at the moment. Hopefully that, that will happen in the future. And the real way to guarantee it will happen is you all coaching the younger players the correct way because they'll eventually come through and the whole thing will balance out if we keep doing it the right way. So, just a reminder of the picture, it's a different one, slightly older. But then and now. So there's a little bit of a difference, not too much, but is change possible? Of course it is. Evolution or revolution or both? I think it's a little bit of both. There's been a revolution in women's football over the years. The evolution has happened, but there's also been some revolutions. And a lot of people, including in here, have fought hard to grow the game. Certainly around the world, some people have, have had massive battles, but they're winning those battles. It's still a slow process. It's still about small steps and chipping away. But more importantly, we never quit. We never give up. And I think that's a massive message. If we want to change, we can. I think in the past, as I said earlier, we've walked out of here and said, this can't happen in Estonia. This won't work in Estonia. And we're always looking to criticise each other maybe, other people, and the problems. Maybe the FA, maybe everything in general. We're looking to criticise instead of saying, how can we communicate, how can we work together? And it's important that we work together to grow. And it is about the future. It's really easy to have a blinkered view on winning a trophy, winning a gold medal this year, tomorrow. But what about five years? What about 10 years? What about 15 years? What about 20 years? Now, you have to think of the future. There's no such word as can't. I don't know how that translates in Estonian, but for me, there's no such word as can't. But there is won't. The choice is yours. The choice is yours. This was quite hard to do. <laughs> <laughs> to match it up. Yeah, we have a new logo coming, but uh, as the women's national team squad, we'll stick with the Lionesses as our, uh, our focus. Uh, and I, again, to repeat, you know, the Lionesses provide everything for the, the pride. The word pride comes into it anyway. The Lionesses go out and do the hunting, bring the food, keep the men in check, and look after the little ones. So I'm happy to keep that as our... Uh, our Logo underneath the, the fantastic new one that you're going to see in a minute. And the new one is fantastic as well, by the way. Um, but it's, it's a different, different usage, different way. Okay. That's me. Aita.